today, as you will note from the bulletin, we are taking a bit of time off from the exposition of the apocalypse to treat the subject of the Christian and the New Year. So I'm going to ask you to turn with me first to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8. And we'll read one verse there and then we'll turn to the Old Testament for a few verses and back again to the New Testament. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8 is the sixth of our Lord's Beatitudes. And He has said, and we read, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now let's turn to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 36, and we'll read verse 24 through verse 28. Now just one word by way of introduction, of course, as you will note immediately from the context, this has to do with some of the things that the Lord will do with reference to the nation Israel in the end times. But of course the principles by which He does this are principles that are true to His eternal being. And so we will read verse 24 through verse 28 as expressing things that He does constantly in accordance with His purpose and nature. For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances, and you will live in the land and I, that I gave to your forefathers, so you will be my people, and I will be your God. Now let's turn back to Paul's first letter to Timothy, and again we'll read just one verse, the fifth verse of chapter 1. First Timothy chapter 1, and verse 5, and uh, the Apostle writes to his young legate, but the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word, and let's bow together in a moment of prayer. Father, we are indeed grateful that Thou hast brought us through this year faithfully and in harmony with the great truths of the Word of God, which are true to Thy being. We thank Thee for the way that Thou hast dealt with us. We rejoice in the goodness and mercy that Thou hast shown to us. And we thank Thee and praise Thee for the life that Thou hast given to us in Jesus Christ. We thank Thee for Him who is our great High Priest and who ever lives to make intercession for His people. And we thank Thee that at this very moment our Lord is praying for us. How blessed we are through His ministry and through His constant care and particularly for the foundation of it all, the blood that was shed on Calvary's cross. We thank Thee for the past year and the faithfulness to us as we have just sung. We look forward to the new year with anticipation. We again, Lord, count upon Thy faithful love and care and mercy expressed toward us through Christ particularly and then in the experiences of life. We pray for this country, for our president. We know, Lord, the significant decisions that he must constantly make that touch the well-being 
of each citizen of this country. We pray for him, give him wisdom and guidance. We pray for the whole church of Jesus Christ, all who through faith have rested their eternal destiny upon him who loved us and gave himself for us at Calvary's cross. And we pray, Lord, that by thy grace the church may continue to grow to its maturity. And uh, we ask, Lord, that if it be thy will that 1990 may be the year in which our Lord returns and we enter into his presence. We rejoice in all that thou hast shown us. We thank thee for the future that lies ahead of us. And we pray for each individual local manifestation of the Church of Christ. We pray for Believer's Chapel. We ask thy blessing upon our elders who give wisdom and guidance and direction to us. And we pray for our deacons who serve as unto the Lord and for every member of this local body of believers, O oh God, may this new year be a year of advance in the knowledge of our Lord. May it be a year in which we truly have a clean heart in order that thy work may be accomplished through us. We pray particularly for our children. We pray, Lord, that as the days go by, they may be brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Sustain the parents, give them wisdom as they seek to raise young lives in the nurture and admonition of our Lord. We pray for the sick. We thank Thee, Lord, for each one of them and ask that Thou wilt strengthen them, give wisdom to those who minister to them, and give healing in accordance with Thy will. For those who have requested our prayers particularly, we pray for them. We ask that Thou wilt minister to them particularly and accomplish Thy perfect will in their lives. And if it please Thee, as it is in harmony with their own desires. Lord, we thank Thee for the day Thou hast given to us. Bless the services of this day, and particularly at our Lord's table, as we remember Him, may it be truly in the Spirit and in truth. For Jesus' sake, amen. The subject for today is, you will note from our bulletin, is a new heart for the new year. It's the time of the year when we think of next year and ask the question, what will it bring? And since it's the end of a decade, we ask, what will the 1990s bring? And I think also we tend to look back over the past years and particularly the last decade and we ask what have the 80s brought? And if we evaluate them from the standpoint of the Christian truth that we love, I think most of us would have to say it seems very little of spiritual value has been brought in the 80s. The news media confirm that politics, economics, and social concerns predominate. In 1976, you may remember Newsweek had a cover article in which it was stated that this was the year of the evangelical. And in the 80s, when you what might have expected the year of the evangelical to broaden into significant influence, the 80s one might say, have been the years of the dead spirit. Carl Henry has written a book called The Twilight of a Great Civilization, The Drift Toward Neo-Paganism, and in it he has a very significant paragraph. He says, the culture context that now envelops evangelical Christianity differs markedly from that of 40 plus years ago and bombards evangelicals with critical new challenges. 
For the moment, I merely mention the unmistakable reemergence of paganism in the West, the continuing growth and power of political atheism, the sinkage of secular humanism into raw naturalism, the erosion of general knowledge of cardinal Christian beliefs, and the decline of public perception of their plausibility, the scrambling of world religions that nurtures skepticism about the finality of any and every religious faith. I think there's a lot of truth in those words and that they effectively present what really has happened to us over the past decade. Well, I want to turn this morning in something of a devotional message to a few passages in the Word of God to express my wish, perhaps we should call it resolution, my wish for the new year, a new heart. And I'd ask you first to turn with me to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8 in which our Lord Himself speaks about the blessedness of a new or a clean heart. This is the sixth of the Beatitudes. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. When you read the Gospel of Matthew and you come to the fifth chapter, you notice that you begin a section in which you have the Sermon on the Mount and then, of course, an account of miracles that our Lord has performed so that these chapters, Matthew 5 through 9, are governed by chapter 4 and verse 23, where we have read, and Jesus was going about in all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. To sum up what He was doing, He was teaching and He was healing. And now we have teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, followed by a series of nine miracles that our Lord has performed. So it's the Sermon and then the Mighty Signs. And when we think of the Sermon on the Mount and ask ourselves just precisely what does this mean, biblical interpreters have often said that what we have when our Lord goes up on the mountain to speak to His disciples is something that parallels the giving of the law to Moses for the children of Israel. In other words, what we have here is a new Sinai with new principles for the disciples who are to live in this interim period before the cross and the coming of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Beatitudes are not gospel. And in fact, the Sermon on the Mount is not gospel. It's very hard to find the gospel in the Sermon on the Mount, and some biblical interpreters even contend that it cannot be found there. What appears to come to us as we read the Sermon on the Mount is essentially what the Law of Moses was. It was designed to give us a knowledge of our sin. And so when one reads the Beatitudes and the remainder of the Sermon on the Mount, the conviction that comes particularly to us is, how is it possible for me to live up to the things that our Lord has set forth? In fact, one tends to feel somewhat despairing when one reads the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes and then looks at one's own life. It seems to me that the proper response to the Sermon on the Mount is the response of the publican who smites his breast and says, Oh, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Or the Apostle Paul's statement in Romans chapter 7 when he's talking about the fact that he has the sin principle dwelling within him, but he has a desire to please God, and finally concludes his chapter with, Oh, wretched man that I am. People who don't like evangelical teaching sometimes say, give me the Sermon on the Mount. Harry Truman used to say, he was a Baptist, he used to say, the Sermon on the Mount is the purest of Christian teaching, and uh, that's the, the teaching by which I regulate my life. Well, there are people who do say 
give me the Sermon on the Mount. And that's all I want. Well, if we took all of the Sermon on the Mount and really took it to our hearts and realized that we could not possibly live up to its teaching and then we flee to Jesus Christ, then of course the Sermon on the Mount would perform a most worthy task. Now the Lord Jesus says in verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart. Now when he's talking about blessed are the pure in heart, one must define this to some extent by what has preceded. And you'll notice he's been talking about those who are poor in spirit. He's been talking about those who mourn. And this is not mourning in the, in the sense of weeping outwardly, but mourning over their condition of spirit. And then he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. In other words, the blessedness of which our Lord talks can only come from knowing our poverty spiritually, our mourning spiritually, our longing for righteousness, a spiritual longing. And uh, then he adds, they shall see God. Purity of heart, John Calvin used to say, was the mother of virtues. But in his day, evidently, people were very much like they are in our, our day because he went on to say, all agree that purity of heart is the mother of all virtues, but there is scarcely a man in a hundred who does not put smart dealing in the place of the highest virtue. So it is that those are generally reckoned blessed who are very clever at weaving schemes of deception, who craftily dodge round an issue whenever they do business. Christ gives no endorsement to the currency of the flesh when he calls those blessed who take no pleasure in cunning but deal honestly with men and put nothing in their hands or, ex or expression but what they also have in their hearts. If they are not so sharp-sighted on earth, they shall enjoy the sight of God in heaven. Well, I think all of us as we read this would recognize that our Lord is expressing a great spiritual truth when he says, blessed are the pure in heart. And the sure consequences are that they shall see God, both here and hereafter, by seeing him in the word, by knowing his presence, by having the sense of communion with him, and by particularly looking at the Word of God in the light of the revelation that is found in the Lord Jesus Christ, remembering that it is He who told Philip, Philip, have I been so long time with you, and yet have you not known me? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Well, when we read this, I say, and we want to make an application to ourselves, we ask, what possible application can this have to me? Now this statement, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, obviously, first of all, can only apply to those who have been justified by the Lord God through the saving ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that impurity unfits for seeing purity. And so consequently, the first step is the step of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Swedenborg profoundly said that the wicked only see blackness where the sun is. Because if we have no harmony with the object that we are looking at, we undoubtedly do not see. And in that sense, if we have nothing but wickedness within our heart and we do not know the justification through Jesus Christ, then it is impossible for us to see God. This past week I was reading the story of the conversion of Alan Gardner and it has impressed me very much and I'd like to gather some of the comments that I make around it. Gardner was a young man who lived in the earlier part of the 19th century. He was an Englishman. He was living in the days when the country was threatened with the horrors of a Napoleonic invasion. 
Lord Nelson was the great idol and hope of the nation. And so he, as a young boy, offered his boyish, boy, the boyish hero worship of an intense and passionate nature. He was only 11 when England was stirred as she had never been stirred by the news of the Battle of Trafalgar, traumatic victory of the English fleet and the del deliverance of the nation. And of course, it was also the time of the death of England's great hero. Every chord of his soul vibrated with the tense emotion of that tremendous day. One of his biographers has written, and within three years, he himself entered the Navy. And he was, after a time of distinguishing himself, he returned to uh, England on uh, the news of the death of his mother. Uh, the recollections of things surged through his mind, and he uh, was deeply disturbed by the fact of his mother's death because she was a Christian, and so was his father. His life took a change for the worst at that time. To the end of his life, he could never speak of the years that intervened between his 15th and his 25th year without feeling great remorse over those particular years. He had distinguished himself in action. He had been sent home with a prize ship. He attained the rank of lieutenant. And he said, I spent those years amidst the headstrong excitement of youth. And uh, though he believed that he had been forgiven through Jesus Christ, nevertheless, even to the end of his days, he had it, found it very hard to cope with what he had himself done as a young man. He spoke about the fact that through those years in which he was far from the Lord, how occasionally he would have a desire to read the Bible. He comments particularly at one time that uh, he felt that he wanted to give the Bible one more chance, but how was he to get one? So he went to a bookseller's shop, and as he started in the store, he uh, saw that other customers were in there, and so he felt that he could not be overheard asking for a Bible. And so he would hang on the outside, and as soon as the customer left, he would start in, but then another customer would come. And so finally, he couldn't uh, stand it any longer. He rushed in, asked for a Bible, and then rushed out and uh, took it home to take a look at it. But his father's petitions for him, his mother's prayers for him still had not brought him what he was looking for. But finally, a letter came to him from an elderly woman who was a friend of his mother who had died. He was in the Straits of Malachi at the time with His Majesty's ship Leander. The mail arrived, brought two letters from him, for him. One full of reproof was from his father who was still living and it tells of the father's anxiety for the son's conduct, for he had heard of it and knew of it. And the other is from the old lady, the intimate friend of his mother's. And she writes him in this way. She said, nothing, nothing, well, uh, just a moment on, the letter begins apologetically. The writer cannot bear to seem censorious, but nevertheless she begs him to read with patience her earnest plea. She warns of the consequences of sin. She reminds him that it was to save man from sin that the son lived and died. And she tells him what he needs above all else is a new heart. Remember, she says, this is not my phrase. It's the very word of Scripture. And unless we have this new heart, this clean heart, this heart of flesh given in exchange for a heart of stone, we cannot believe effectually. She quotes from David in Psalm 51:10, Create in me a clean heart, O Lord, 
And she quotes from Ezekiel, the passage we read in our scripture reading this morning. A new heart will I give you. You will perhaps ask, she continues in her letter, how this new heart can be obtained. It's the gift of God exclusively. None but He can create it. And the letter throbs with a note of urgency. Nothing that is holy or impure can enter heaven. Ye must be born again. Must take place while we live, for as we are found in death, we shall forever be. There is no repentance in the grave, nor pardon offered to the grave. I would say that that's good preaching from an, an elderly lady to a young seaman. At any rate, he read the letter again and again. It seems more impressing, impressive and appealing to him with each perusal. He makes copies of it, one which, together with a Bible that he bought at the time, he carries with him in all his subsequent voyages. Alan Gardner, the young lieutenant, the promising naval officer, now has a new heart and a clean heart. But uh, the thing that began to touch his heart particularly was God had trained him in his naval work, and so now, with God's help, he aspires to serve where the perils are the thickest, where the hazards are the greatest, and where the obstacles are most insuperable. He will consecrate his nautical skill to the most sublime ends. He will be the pioneer of the missionary. And so, he will penetrate the darkest continents of the, hemis of the universe at that time, Africa and South America, in order to open up a way for the cross. And so, his aim at that point began to be to be a harbinger and a pathfinder among the most barbarous and degraded races of mankind. This, the new heart has brought. Now, I'd like for you at this point, I'd like to say a few more words about him later on, but I'd like for you to turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 36, because here in the great principles that are set forth in Ezekiel 36, we have the creation of a clean heart. What he will do on a national ethnic scale, the Lord God will do always, for he works according to his eternal principles, the principles of his eternal being in all of his work. Now, you know from listening to the ministry of the Word of God in Believer's Chapel that it has been the contention of the ministry here that there are two principles that can be called within the Christian family, two principles of approach to the Christian truth. There is a grace approach, that is, a contended grace approach that insists that our free will has the power of cooperation to make grace effectual, a power of resisting to make ineffectual, and that God must await the action of our free will before giving grace. Grace, according to this particular approach to the truth of Scripture, is only moral persuasion by the Word, not infusion of a new life. It does not give us anything that we do not already have. So that's the key point. God must await the action of our free will before giving the grace of conversion. Now, the words of those who proclaim this kind of theology are precisely this. One can find them specifically in their writings, and uh, there is no question about it. What we are talking about is a, a viewpoint expressed by many that it is the decision of our free will from ourselves that determines God's blessing. On the other hand, there are those who contend that this is contrary to the truth of the Word of God, that grace produces the intended effect 
without successful resistance. In other words, there may be resistance, but ultimately God in His marvelous grace transforms our will so that we respond to the truth of the Word of God. Grace prepares the will to respond to the Word. In other words, according to this approach to Christian truth, the work begins with God. As the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6 writes, He that hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Or as Jeremiah puts it in uh, Jeremiah in his Lamentations in chapter 5 and verse 21, I'd like to read that verse. He says, Restore to us, restore us to thee, O Lord, that we may be restored. As the authorized version renders it, turn thou unto un, turn us, turn thou us unto thee, O Lord, and we shall be turned. Renew our days as of old. And according to the second approach, the will's first act is moved by his divine grace. I've often cited uh, Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse, who may, who used to say that our will does not respond to spiritual things until God has jiggled our willer. Now that is precisely what we find in the Word of God, in my opinion. The will then responds to the divine grace, and the divine grace first transforms the will. That grace is irresistible, not in the sense that it overwhelms us and forces us to do something that we not, do not want to do, but it's irresistible in that it infallibly produces its effect. As Peter says, who can withstand God? It mollifies the heart, it moves, and it courts the heart and until the heart finally freely responds to the love of God. The special grace is external in the Word, internal in the Spirit's infused vital principle, creating a new heart with a new habit of faith, a new inclination of the will, and new affections of the heart. You remember Jeremiah in chapter 32 in verse 40 in one of his great sections, a section that has to do with the New Covenant, makes this statement, giving the words of God, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good, and I will put the fear of me in their hearts so that they will not turn away from me. So, notice the statement, I will put the fear of me in their hearts. You know, when you think about this, you, it's amazing that we could have questions about, uh, after reading the Word of God, questions about the fact that salvation is essentially the work of God. It's not the work of man. It's not God waiting for us to do something, but it's God doing something so that we respond to His will and uh, respond to Him in the worship and praise that flows from salvation. Do you think for one moment, as you think about Ezekiel chapter 36, do you think for one moment that it is in the power of a stony heart to remove its stoniness and to make itself a heart of flesh? Think about that for just one moment. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Is it within the power of a stony heart to remove itself and to make itself a heart of flesh? Now, one view of Christian truth is that it is. For God waits for the act of the human will, his free will, so that it is necessary that one remove 
the stony heart and replace it with a heart of flesh. But if it's a stony heart, it cannot make itself a heart of flesh. It wouldn't then be a stony heart if that were true. The same thing with regard to the resurrection of the spirit or the bringing of new life to it. What kind of arguments do you think we would have to propose to a man's spirit? So a spirit that is dead that will force it to resurrect itself. This is the kind of thing that we are really talking about when we talk about these two approaches to Christian truth. But now looking at Ezekiel, I want you to notice how God puts what He's going to do in the future. It's not, O oh Israel, I'm going to wait until you of your free will turn to me. Notice how He puts it. About 15 times He will say, I will, I will. Verse 22 of Ezekiel chapter 36, Therefore, Say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations. In the middle of the text, then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all of your filthiness and from all of your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances, and you will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers, so you will be my people, and I will be your God. We call that an unconditional covenant fulfilled by the power of God. No waiting for Israel to change their heart, but God covenanting that He will mollify their heart, change their heart, so change them that the heart of stone becomes a heart of flesh. Or to turn to the New Testament, you may remember when the Apostle Paul was preaching in Europe, and he came to Philippi, and there in Philippi, recorded in chapter 16 of the book of Acts, he was preaching, and there was a woman named Lydia who was there, and we read, and on the Sabbath day we went outside the gate, Luke says, to the riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled, and a certain woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening, and she opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. No, no. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. No wonder that he wrote the Philippians and said, uh, spoke about the fact that it's God who has begun the work in your hearts and he will complete it. Now, you can see then when we talk about a new heart, when we talk about a clean heart, we're talking about something that God performs. When I think of the new year of 1990, I think of the fact that for me, the one thing that I would desire would be for God to further cleanse my heart, to make it new in every way. New, of course, if I were not a believer, which I am, a new heart in that sense, a justified heart. But as a believer, a new and clean heart 
in the most spiritual and sanctifying sense. Now in the last text that we were looking at in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5, Timothy is told by the Apostle Paul, verse 5 of chapter 1, but the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. The practical aim of God's gracious provision, the deep fountainhead of all outgoings of Christian love is a purified heart, a conscience orientated by the Holy Spirit, and a sincere faith, love for God and love for man. Alan Gardner, after his conversion, after he had been given a new heart, dedicated himself wholeheartedly to the proclamation of the Scriptures to those who had never received the Word of God. <clears throat> he spoke about the fact that had God not prepared the way, he would never have been able to receive such a new heart. As a small boy, he had been eager to follow the great Nelson. One night his mother came into his room with her candle in hand and she looked over on the bed and the bed was still made. She was astonished. She looked around with the bed undisturbed and finally found the boy over fast asleep on the floor. He explained the next morning that he expected to live a rough life with constant privations and he wanted to get ready for it as a young child. Well, it was a kind of prophecy of his life. When he became a Christian with a new heart, he thirsts for no fame, no longer, no rewards. He endures as seeing him who is invisible, seeing God, the sublime prerogative of the pure-hearted. He takes the whole world as the sphere of his activities by the grace of God. So he went into the interior of Africa. He dares a thousand deaths among the Hottentots, the Kaffirs, the Zulus, the Bushmen. We catch glances of him as we follow his life, intervening between hostile tribes, undertaking perilous marches among the mountains reported to be impassable, lying at the point of starvation among the reeds of the swampy riverbeds, listening to the snorting and grunting of the hippotami, uh, around him at different stages of his adventurous career. We find him in Tahiti, at Borneo, at Papua, at the most outlandish places, but ever with one end in view. He wanted to blaze a trail along which the missionary may bring to the most benighted the light of the everlasting gospel. He makes his way to the Falkland Islands, and from that chilly outpost looks wistfully across to the snow-capped, storm-swept coasts of Patagonia. And if you know your geography, you know that's on the tip of South America, and it's not a pleasant part of the world. There is Tierra del Fuego, the archipelago in which there are numerous islands, but it is the most treacherous of weather. He looks across. And uh, this place is dreary enough, but uh, it's a paradise compared with uh, the places he's been, a paradise as compared with that desolate end of the Western world toward which he now turns his face. And moreover, the Fuegians at that time from Tierra del Fuego were as degraded a, pistol, a, a people as any on the face of the earth and are churlishly inhospitable to strangers. And so still, he wants to seek the most hopeless, most uncultivated place in order to plant the gospel there. And there, with a smile on his face, he goes to his tragic death. He literally died singing. The annals of adventure in missionary work contain few records more pathetic than the story of those last dreadful weeks on the cruel coast. He made it from the Falcons over to the southern coast of South America, and there with the seven men, he and they began to starve to death. One by one, they closed their eyes, 
yielded their spirits back to God. Two only were left finally, Maidment and Gardner. And for a few days, the captain is able to hobble, hobble on a pair of roughly fashioned crutches to the cavern in which his comrade lies, and he himself occupies an open boat on the beach. And then, no one will ever know which one of the two died first. The relief expedition found the two unburied bodies, Maidment's in the cavern, and Gardner's beside the boat. He was evidently too weak to clamber back into it where he would spend his night. On the rocks, Gardner, anxious that his friend should be found, had painted a hand toward the mouth of the cavern so that when any rescuers came, they would go in the cavern and find the body of his friend. And then he wrote these words, My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. Trust in him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. The relief expedition found the priceless records that he had kept of what they had done. The tide ebbed and flowed, went over the papers, but nevertheless they were preserved. And the handwriting was still plain. And every sentence vibrated with jubilant triumph. Again and again he breaks into poetry. Although, he sings, my daily bread has failed, I know from whence it came, and still his faithful promises are every day the same. His words the same forevermore as when they first were given. Yea, blessed thought they cannot fail, though earth dissolve with heaven. Uh, and though earth dissolve in heaven. On the day that precedes his death, he assures us that though four days without food, he has no sensation of hunger. And these are the last sentences that Captain Gardner ever penned. I want you to listen to him, because if anything shows a new heart, they do. Yet a little while, and through grace, we shall join that blessed throng that sing the praises of Christ throughout eternity. I neither hunger nor thirst, though five days without food. Marvelous kindness to me, a sinner. The work that was done at Tierra del Fuego was so astonishing that when Charles, Charles Darwin came to Tierra del Fuego, that he said, that what had been done there was the brightest trophy that Christianity had ever won. And he himself, Mr. Darwin, liberally supported the Christian work there. A new heart, O oh God, create within me a clean heart. The fast approaching new year, 1990, is the last decade before a new millennium. Deo volente, the Lord willing. And it calls for fresh commitment. New dedication by believers to confession, to communion and service, even the nursery. In a word, let us with David as we look at the new year cry out with him for a clean heart. That our Lord promises to give. For those up to now in believing, it's the same cry with only a slight modification, a cry for a new heart, recognizing that there can be no such heart without conversion. The look of faith to the Savior on the cross, offering the atoning satisfaction of his redeeming blood. And when by God's grace our minds are opened to that great fact, God gives that new heart, that clean heart, the heart of justification and the heart that determines by God's grace to serve him wholeheartedly. Wouldn't it be wonderful if 1990 meant that to each of us? That's my prayer. I hope it's yours too. Let's stand for the benediction. Father, we are indeed grateful.
for the great men and women who have gone before us in the family of God and who have given themselves to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ wholeheartedly. We thank thee for men like Captain Alan Gardner and the many others who touched by God the Holy Spirit, turned by thee, Lord, from the wickedness of their ways to our Lord Jesus Christ, given by thee a new heart, to thee be all the praise, who have gone before us and are in the presence of the Lord at this present time, rejoicing in the completion of their labors. O oh God, give us just such a clean heart, just such dedication to service of Thee. And Lord, if there should be someone in this audience who has not yet believed in Him, may, as they recognize that all that we are and all that we have or ever hope to be is found in the saving work of the shedding of the blood on Calvary's cross. May they, O oh Lord, turn to him and give him thanks at this moment for the blood that was shed for sinners. For Jesus' sake, amen. Mm -hmm.